صباح الخير او مساء الخير حسب Good morning or good afternoon uh, depending on where you are located now and uh, I welcome all of you to this uh, conference we are holding in partnership with ODI Overseas Development Institute uh, based in the UK this uh, conference uh, focuses on uh, coronavirus pandemic and uh, the local efforts to combat and respond to this pandemic and we will focus on North Africa the North African region uh, today but uh, as USIP we are uh, so excited uh, to this conference and to the subsequent one because it's the first time we have an official collaboration and partnership with ODI. It's also the first time to uh, organize uh, such a big scale conference on the MENA region and in the Arabic uh, or using Arabic language. So we have many new aspects. The partnership, first and foremost, the audience and the speakers. And therefore, we hope that it will prove to be beneficial to us and to all participants and uh, speakers. I already said that uh, this partnership will not be limited to this conference. We will have a subsequent uh, conference on uh, the Middle East, and uh, we will focus on Iraq, Syria, Yemen, uh, hopefully. And uh, before giving the floor to uh, our speakers and uh, to the opening remarks, uh, we hope that this conference will lead or yield some conclusions that can be used for publications uh, and we also aspire that uh, we will shed light on certain issues and uh, topics that deserve more research and more in-depth look so we have dual objective in this conference in addition, of course, to the discussion and to the exchange of ideas, we hope that we will have something tangible we can use for uh, our publications and we can use also in our research in the MENA region. We have a list of uh, speakers, um, very prestigious list uh, with people um, boasting uh, long experience and uh, quite reputable in the region, basically in peace building and facilitation. And before giving the floor to uh, each speakers and uh, before, uh, before doing that, allow me to uh, explain some ground rules, technical ground rules for the speakers first. Uh, please mute your microphones. Uh, so that we don't have or we don't suffer interference and uh, regarding uh, participants and audience if you wish and we encourage you actually to ask questions and to uh, um, give your input you can use uh, the Q&A function everything you write there uh, will be um, reaching us so there is a chat room and uh, you can use the Q&A feature there. And we have also uh, simultaneous interpretation, as I said, interpretation from Arabic into English. And if you want to use uh, the interpretation, you will unfortunately see Korean and not Arabic. Uh, um, but we will use Korean for the purpose uh, of interpretation into Arabic here, unfortunately. That's a technical problem with the Zoom, actually. And uh, uh, these are the technical matters I wanted to shed light on at the beginning. And after listening to our speakers, we will open the floor for Q&A session. So without further ado, I will give the floor to Dr. Mike Yafi, who is going to be the first speaker. Uh, he's uh, the uh, deputy president uh, uh, for USIP uh, and before joining USIP he worked in uh, many other senior positions in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or Department of State in the US and he worked on the uh, Israeli-Palestinian negotiations and also uh, worked with the um, uh, 
special envoy on the MENA region, UN special envoy. And uh, he also has a career or had, ha has had a career in the university, uh, in the National uh, Defense uh, University in the US. And uh, he had had contributions in uh, um, various conferences. Uh, and without further ado, I will give the floor to Dr. Mike so that uh, he uh, gives us his opening remark. Mike, the floor is yours. The mic, actually. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ely. Um, and good day to everybody. Um, on behalf of the U.S. Institute of Peace, uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to this uh, webinar. Um, the U.S. Institute of Peace has been very active during the coronavirus in trying to understand how the coronavirus is in, impacting regions around the world in which we are working. Uh, the Institute, as many may know, was formed in the 1980s as a as an act of Congress to provide a nonpartisan independent place for analysis and for conducting peace building around the world. Um, and as part of this, we have actually now set up offices in a variety of places, including what we call our hub in Tunis, uh, which uh, Dr. Eli uh, is the manager of that, the director of that. Um, so, so let me at least begin with um, by thanking um, my uh, colleagues who have been working on this program. Uh, from uh, from USIP, we have the Middle East North Africa team, which includes Eli, Suher, and Fatma. And then it is uh, with great pleasure that we have partnered with the Overseas Development Institute, uh, particularly with Dr. Uh, Shireen Atarabusi, uh, who will be speaking next. Um, but again, I want to thank them for this partnership. This, uh, this meeting has been coming about for, uh, uh, for some time. It's been coming about since we've been watching this, this pandemic take and grab hold of places around the world. And we have been very concerned, of course, as it was spreading to the North Africa region and what would be the impact of the coronavirus. Um, and we look at that in terms of first order effect and then second and third order effects. And by that, I mean, is the, the first order effects is actually on the physical health of, and safety of individuals. Um, and, um, but we don't want to miss out on what are the second and third order effects. What affects the political dynamics? What affects overall security? What affects the economic situation? And so there's lots of elements to understanding how the coronavirus impacts each country. And we know that it impacts each country differently. And so it, there's, it says, uh, as we have seen in terms of both in terms of uh, how it impacts the number of people who come become ill, the number of people who are able to get uh, health care, and the number of people who have actually died from, from the coronavirus. And then we see that it also impacts then um, how, it how it affects individual freedoms within countries. Uh, we see that it has had an impact on the ability to, uh, to have uh, um, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, freedom to demonstrate. Um, so we see that it has that kind of effect. It also has impact on food security um, and in addition to, uh, to unemployment and the whole basic social contract between the government and the people itself has it been impacted by all of these kind of dynamics by the coronavirus. And in many cases, these, it has exacerbated, exacerbated already um, difficult situations to begin with, even those conditions that were there prior to the coronavirus. So it is also a moment then where this is where we as peace builders have been trying to grapple with these issues. And, um, and in this sense, there has been a lot of elements where uh, peace builders have been trying to deal with the fragility of the individual states. And it is hoped that, that uh, an outcome from today's meeting will be that we will have a better understanding about how, what the peace builders have been doing to try to grapple with the effects, the first, the second, the third order effects of the coronavirus. So I'm really, ho I'm really looking forward to the hearing the discussion today and, the, and getting updated on what has been happening and how better we can, we can deal with the coronavirus and going into the future. 
So again, I want to thank um, our partners who helped bring this together. Thank you all of you who have joined us today. And now I'm going to turn it over to Shireen for her open remarks from ODI. Shireen? Yes, thank you, Mike. Uh, just to introduce Shireen. Uh, so, uh, the Dr. Shireen. Second speaker, um, Dr. Shireen Atrabulsi McCarthy, and uh, uh, she is a senior researcher. She, she's more, more than senior. Uh, she is a um, senior research fellow. Uh, in ODI, and she has a prestigious uh, career in research on conflict and humanitarian uh, policies and security. And she worked on different um, pieces and, res and uh, uh, many project research projects uh, in Africa and globally. We are honored because Shireen is a partner to USIP in more than one initiative, and USIP has benefited a lot from the experience and input provided and presented by Shireen. So thank you, Shireen, for everything, not not just for this event. Thank you, Eli. Thank you, Michael, and I thank all speakers and audience, USIP. And as Dr. Eli said, we are partners. Uh, for years now, not uh, not it's not the first time, and I'm very pleased uh, for this opportunity, and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to discussing this important thorny issue. Uh, on behalf of ODI, I would like to express uh, condolences to the victims of Beirut explosion, and I hope uh, a speedy recovery to the victims uh, and the, the casualties. It's a real disaster, and it, if it reflects anything, it does reflect um, the scale of the crisis the whole region is going through. and. Uh, I think it all boils down to peace, peace efforts, local peace endeavors, and the impact of coronavirus on these endeavors. Uh, these um, crises uh, are the result of uh, the vulnerable state and, uh, and also the anger, the wrath of citizens, uh, just as we are seeing now uh, in Lebanon, and uh, also uh, weakness from the international community uh, there are many um, there, are, there is a lot of uh, uh, assistance provided by the international community but uh, uh, we are wondering what is the impact of this assistance on the long term and is there going to be um, real support on the long term for Lebanon, not just Lebanon here, but many countries in the region which are in a dire um, in a dire situation because of the coronavirus. In addition to other uh, reasons for the crisis, of course. So in ODI, we launched a, an initiative. Uh, targeting uh, the Mediterranean region, and we are calling for rethinking of uh, power balance in the region. Uh, we have many contradictions, many incongruities in the region, uh, many crises, but also many opportunities, economic, cultural, and uh, other diverse opportunities. And uh, through this initiative, we want to rethink about the relationship between uh, Western countries and uh, the Mediterranean countries and use this as opportunity as a platform for a new vision, a new perspective to the Mediterranean, uh, a new lens to the Mediterranean, actually, uh, whether through research, through rethinking the um, international security, global security, and also rethinking peace uh, locally and uh, globally, rethinking economic uh, growth and development, and also focusing on the grassroots aspiration and not just a top-down priority setting. So we hope that we will learn from the deficiencies and failures of the past and uh, translate that into viable um, policies and the objective behind this initiative is to restore uh, trust and legitimacy between international uh, 
uh, organizations and grassroots uh, organizations and communities by shedding more light on on voices stemming from the communities themselves. And this is just the beginning, and I would like to thank ELI and USIP for um, their support and belief in this initiative. And uh, we're looking forward to to more collaboration and to hearing from all of you. Thank you. Go ahead, Eli. Thank you, Shireen. Without further ado, I move uh, directly, and we move on directly to the third speaker, Mr. Ahmed Abdel Wahed from Egypt. In addition to being the partner of USIP, uh, uh, he is also uh, he he has also an office. Uh, he's uh, the head of the organization uh, working in Egypt, and uh, he has a lot of experience in the civil society uh, activity and in local governance. He worked with the local, regional, and international organizations. And he will tell us uh, now, give us more information about uh, his experience on peace building and how the coronavirus is affecting peace building efforts. Thank you, Eli. Uh, I thank Mike, Shireen, and uh, all other speakers. Let me thank uh, USIP and ODI for the opportunity presented. I uh, agree and I concur with Shireen uh, in expressing condolences to the victims um, in Lebanon and all victims in the MENA region and around the world. Uh, they are actually innocents, but they are paying the cost, um, the cost of something they, um, they are not, uh, they're not responsible for. Uh, if I will talk about the repercussions and the implications, I would like to focus on um, the, the, the talks and negotiations that are taking place in Egypt about the Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. I think, uh, uh, this is a very hot issue, a recurrent issue that is considered the top priority for uh, the political leadership in Egypt and uh, for uh, the entire Egyptian population in general. We are talking about uh, an issue that pertains to water, to, um, to the security of a whole country of 100 million population. We're talking about an economic, social, and security priority or issue. And uh, uh, we noticed that uh, uh, the negotiations uh, uh, and the whole process uh, has been affected by uh, the corona virus uh, and uh, the outbreak. Uh, all, uh, all the phases and all the talks uh, uh, took place um, virtually as conference calls. And uh, to what extent does this uh, uh, have an impact on uh, the trajectory and on the mechanisms uh, of negotiation? I don't think it, uh, it has uh, an impact because the political leadership and uh, thanks to the support of the grassroots communities um, in Egypt, uh, the political leadership think that this is a matter of uh, top priority uh, for the nation, and there is a, um, a campaign at the level of uh, uh, the country, at the level of the continent, the African continent, and globally. And that has been um, very clear in the um, African summit lately, where there was an agreement that uh, the dam shouldn't be filled uh, unless there is a a binding agreement, uh, and Egypt was very interested uh, and keen on having a UN assembly on discussing this matter. Uh, this one, this is one of the details that is very important uh, if we want to discuss the repercussions of uh, the pandemic on the politics of the nation. What we 
notice also is that there is a complete and absolute uh, community support for uh, the trajectory or the the priorities of uh, the political leadership and there is a trust mutual trust on the management of this issue uh, the second detail or idea i want to talk about is uh, the impact on the economic life and livelihood of uh, the Egyptian uh, population. Um, those who have a low income and those who work on daily basis uh, have been affected in a very dire way and it crippled their economic uh, revenues. We uh, talk about Egypt and uh, the social cohesion is very strong in Egypt. So uh, the social distancing, the new concept of social distancing and physical distancing has been very tricky and uh, hard to implement uh, in Egypt. In general, if we want to shed light on the extent to which um, the impact was clear and obvious on uh, peace building efforts and on um, social harmony, I can say that the impact was not very remarkable. Uh, we don't see that there is a real shift, a real change uh, when it comes to the peace talks uh, taking place internally, locally or uh, externally. Eli, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ahmed. Now I will move to Dr. Tarak Ghazal, who is also uh, one of our partners uh, in the Tunisian uh, network of facilitators, and uh, he is also the uh, manager of an organization, uh, FHI, uh, manager of their office in the south. Uh, uh, Tarak has more experience, uh, much more than that. Uh, he has been working on issues uh, uh, pertaining to violence, uh, to conflict, and uh, youth engagement. Uh, and he worked with uh, many organizations and on many projects. And uh, through his work in uh, the Tunisian network of facilitators, he was a key partner in a dialogue initiative that was implemented in Midnin, in the south of Tunisia. And uh, the objective of that was to de-escalate the situation between youth and uh, um, security officials and the security agency or police in Medin. And uh, this uh, dialogue led to a mechanism of communication and uh, conflict resolution between the two parties or sides. Thank you, Tarak, uh, for this work. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ali. I thank you, SIP, for this opportunity. I concur with uh, the previous speakers, and I express my condolences um, uh, condolences to the victims of the pandemic, and uh, also, um, unfortunately, the victims of the explosion uh, that uh, took place in Beirut port. Uh, all my heartfelt condolences to the people of Lebanon, which is dear to my heart and to all Tunisians, because we have uh, uh, long-standing historic uh, ties with uh, Lebanon. Though it's uh, being said uh, that uh, the founder of Carthage is uh, from Lebanon, uh, and uh, this shows that uh, we have ties that are deeply rooted in the past. Uh, in my opinion, COVID-19 crisis has has always been an opportunity for us as uh, people working on peace building, as researchers uh, also to f to measure and to understand the dynamics um, that um, resulted or that are uh, born through um, this crisis. And I would like to talk about the community resilience in uh, Tunisia. I take uh, the Tunisian community as an example here. And uh, of course, uh, resilience is being defined as uh, the ability of individuals or societies anywhere in the world to adapt, to cope with a crisis and to recover from that crisis. And uh, 
um, this uh, resilience can go through uh, three main phases, expecting and uh, uh, anticipating the crisis, reducing its impact, and third, uh, adjusting and coping to it without uh, compromising development, uh, adapting and expecting uh, the implications uh, cannot be an individual endeavor. It's a collective per excellence, and this uh, sends us to the importance of coordination and harmonization between the different parties to reinforce uh, the resilience of a community. And I would like to talk about the pandemic, the corona pandemic or COVID-19, which created a, so a new sort of crisis, sanitary or health crisis in Tunisia. The crisis uh, erupted um, with the media focus on the matter, and we, the terminology used was a warlike, uh, belligerent uh, uh, jargon or discourse. The minister became a general, and uh, the doctors became officers, and people, um, there are people on the front line that is uh, um, liable or prone to, to being sick. Uh, these terms, uh, these military terms uh, used in the past against terrorism uh, and in the past were a pretext to compromise uh, freedoms and liberties. And here, uh, the, what uh, it compromised is uh, the right to ha have access to health and also to economic and social opportunities. So the fear was uh, to use uh, this war against coronavirus to compromise freedoms and liberties and rights to have access to health, for example. This created a sort of panic and suspicion, uh, an aura of an easiness, and uh, this led to um, dire issues in the Tunisian hospitals. Tunisian hospitals uh, lack a lot of equipment and a lot, a lot of resources, and we don't have a clear strategy on how to respond to such a uh, large-scale pandemic. So, further, or in addition to that, it was a social, socio-economic crisis, as Mr. Ahmed said. Many Tunisians lost their jobs. Um, uh, co coupled with that, many indicators uh, signaled that uh, um, a potential uh, conflict may erupt here or there. So, it was uh, essential and. Uh, it was necessary that many organizations adapted and adjusted their activities to the new reality and to supporting the state effort in this sense. I give you an example. Eli talked about uh, the Tunisian network of facilitators. It was uh, actually a dialogue initiative. And uh, here, of course, it was uh, in principle between the youth and uh, um, security or the police uh, agencies or authorities and also to try to de-escalate the situation and the tension between both parties. These unofficial or non-official networks uh, and channels uh, work together to provide uh, disinfection kits to uh, police officers and police staff. Uh, and uh, second, or more than that, they work together on resolving the issues in the uh, hospital of Medin, the local hospital of Medin, because they expected, uh, due to the lack of equipment and uh, medical resources, uh, there will be problems to have access to health and to the services, uh, medical services. So we thank USIP here because we worked together to provide as much as possible medical kits and equipment to de-escalate uh, the situation and to meet the needs of the citizens. And uh, there was a coordination between youth and police in order to send a very positive message to the community. In Gafsa, say, uh, similar or similarly to that, uh, <clears throat> our youth worked on um, organizing the queues uh, in front of uh, banks and posts and um, of course, uh, people were um, uh, crammed in front of banks and in front of uh, um, postal offices. So uh, uh, our network and our youth worked on organizing the queues and working on um, sensitization and awareness raising. I will talk also about the project uh, I'm going 
uh, I'm working on with the FHI 360, which is about uh, uh, Tunisia resilience and community empowerment. It brings together different uh, interveners and different parties locally and, and regionally. And we worked um, with the local authorities, regional authorities, in order to identify the needs and we responded with a distribution of food and uh, also disinfecting streets and facilities in order to support the effort of uh, the state. In conclusion, there is coordination, I can say, I can safely say, but uh, there, is, there are different pieces and uh, ability to respond. We noticed that uh, society organizations and uh, communities are quicker in their response, quicker than the state. And uh, when uh, we notice that the state is following up or accompanying um, civil society, this can be good in some aspects, but it's dire in certain other aspects. And we can follow the discussion later in the Q&A session. Finally, I want to say that uh, the pandemic is still pervasive in Tunisia. We are just evaluating the first phase of it, and we hope that we will overcome the pandemic once and uh, for all. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, Dr. Tarak. The last speakers before opening the floor for the Q&A, Mr. Ahmed Bibas. Maybe uh, you don't know Ahmed personally, but you know his organization, Mumkin organization for uh, awareness raising. And uh, it's a very famous organization in Libya. Uh, they have been working from 2013 on projects pertaining to um, sensitization and uh, awareness raising using media. They also work on research and uh, um, peace building and dialogue organization. And we have been uh, lucky in USIP to partner with the Munken organization on more than one activity and one project. And uh, last or chief among which uh, is the dialogue that was uh, held uh, during the Corona outbreak. And our team continued with this uh, dialogue process and it led to uh, an agreement that for us and for Munkin, it's uh, considered to be a great achievement in such uh, dire circumstances on the field. Ahmed and uh, the team were uh, or played a key role in uh, reaching this uh, excellent result. Uh, I would like to thank you, Ahmed, once again for this uh, uh, fruitful collaboration and for the team working in very difficult situation and the floor is yours. Thank you, Eli, for this uh, very uh, excellent introduction. I am uh, humbled uh, by your words. Uh, I am Ahmed Bibars, uh, CEO of Mumkin, uh, based in Tripoli. I will talk about the regional and then local aspects. Uh, regionally speaking, uh, um, uh, coronavirus created new channels of interventions uh, um, in the Libyan conflict. For example, we noticed the Russian intervention growing more and more with uh, selling more arms and weapons. And uh, uh, also uh, settling scores, uh, international scores uh, within Libya, for example, Turkey, uh, Egypt, uh, Qatar, Russia, uh, USA, France. Uh, that's um, regionally speaking uh, what's happening with the uh, international intervention in Libya. Uh, locally, the uh, pandemic uh, outbreak took place uh, with the war. Um, it did not really uh, impact uh, uh, the war. It um, actually exacerbated the war uh, negatively. But uh, there are some positive opportunities, actually, uh, because the clashes in Tripoli uh, make, made the um, pandemic uh, 
outbreak uh, slower and slower in Libya because people cannot travel, cannot move freely also. Um, uh, the emergency measures uh, also reduced uh, um, or curb the monitoring of uh, money disbursement and financial disbursement for um, responding to the corona pandemic and uh, how to um, make um, communities more resilient uh, with regard to the new situation. Now people are protesting and uh, are fed up actually with the situation. That's why we are seeing many uh, peaceful, non-violent uh, protests and activities and uh, this shows that uh, the people are jaded with the uh, corruption for example what's happening with the electricity company now with the change of the management uh, what we are seeing in libya during the nine last years is uh, an increase in or, or per pervasive increase in corruption um, accompanied by uh, widespread of militias um, but it's the first time after Gaddafi's fall to have uh, all the population rise against uh, uh, one entity, which is the corrupt government. Uh, uh, citizens in general, um, what were these militias or the revolutionaries who rose against uh, uh, Haftar are against the military. Uh, they don't they don't see in Benghazi the model uh, they want to follow. And the reaction from that side is that, uh, uh, of course, uh, these people are uh, living or acting in total lawlessness. But in the same time, um, uh, some government, some ministers within the GNA are rising against uh, uh, corruption. And uh, also, um, uh, we are seeing meetings lately uh, focusing on corruption, mainly with the disbursement of uh, subsidies and money to respond to the corona virus. In my opinion, personally, uh, stabilization in Libya and uh, peace building goes or depends on uh, fighting corruption. Uh, also, municipal authorities um, acted differently with regard to the um, pandemic. Some uh, municipalities uh, implemented the resolutions of uh, the GNA, uh, for example, the partial curfew and, uh, and also the suspension of certain commercial activities. But in some other activity, uh, some other municipalities, actually, uh, the municipal uh, authority couldn't implement the resolutions and decisions of the GNA, notably in the south and in the West Mountain. Uh, we saw or we noticed that uh, municipalities and local authorities were uh, united in their call to uh, provide um, or to uh, to provide the budgeting, the necessary budgeting on managing and responding to the coronavirus. Um, in Tripoli, we, uh, what, was, what was positive is that uh, certain um, businessmen provided support to the medical efforts like providing quarantine facilities and uh, necessary equipment to the hospital. So um, it has created a new cohesion, and uh, uh, we have been lacking that in the last years. In Libya, civil society is not that uh, strong and powerful. There are limit. There is a limited number of civil society organizations, but and very few of them uh, adapted and reacted to the new situation and continued their work. Um, taken into consideration that they had to provide also uh, hygiene kits, uh, disinfection uh, uh, equipment, and so on and so forth. In some organizations uh, which adapted to the new situation, to the pandemic, they provided online uh, learning courses, online training to help um, uh, students which uh, uh, stayed at home.
because of the suspension of schools. Uh, we also worked with some teachers uh, virtually on providing online courses to, to pupils and uh, uh, some organizations like UNDP are also continuing their uh, uh, trainings and training program in general. Uh, some organizations also worked on de-escalating the situation They worked on uh, developing new strategies to alleviate uh, the difficulties and uh, the repercussions of uh, the coronavirus, uh, new methods of distribution of food and assistance. Uh, another organization, ITS, uh, um, equipped a uh, communication center to receive uh, complaints and um, questions from the citizens, uh, for example, on issues pertaining to corona, the corona pandemic. Um, uh, also, uh, other organizations worked with the with uh, American organizations, uh, medical organizations on exchange of uh, expertise and experience. And it ha this experience has been highly beneficial and fruitful to the medical doctors in Libya. And uh, uh, IOM uh, currently working with its partners on um, on providing online courses on peace building and uh, how to target youth in order to enlarge the circle of peace uh, uh, builders at the same time we noticed that there is a uh, some sort of tension between civil society organization and the government um, mainly due to the governmental bureaucracy and uh, the suspicion of government with regard to the activities of these civil uh, uh, society organizations. It's, uh, mm, their thinking is that uh, they are working uh, with the international intelligence agencies. It's like the conspiracy theory. They don't understand uh, where they come from. and. Uh, and when these organizations provide support or provide funding to uh, national um, uh, agencies or facilities, they ask them, why are you providing this assistance for what and in exchange of what, etc. And this suspicion and uneasiness is uh, still persisting and continuing, uh, socially speaking, um, social um, gatherings have been prohibited. Uh, um, like in weddings, funerals, and so on and so forth. But uh, this hasn't been implemented very rigorously, and uh, um, the cases of infection and uh, um, the new cases uh, outbreak has been the result of uh, weddings being held and funerals. Uh, also, economically and socially, uh, the government reduced the salaries of employees, and this created uh, or led to the anger and uh, the of course, this created an economic crisis, and uh, the government is complaining now that uh, they don't have enough money to to do the current um, expenditures or to uh, to cover the current expenditures. Thank you. This is in summary what's uh, going on in Libya. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. I thank all the audience who are already starting to ask questions. Uh, we have uh, seven or eight questions that are very important and worthy of uh, responding to. Shireen would like to add something about Libya and then we carry on. I'd like to thank all speakers. Uh, I would like to jump on one important point um, raised by Ahmed by uh, the speaker from Tunisia and by Libya also. At the international level, they are focusing more on um, the implications of the pandemic on peace and uh, conflict. But alongside this focus, we need to describe the situation where the coronavirus has um, has broken out uh, 
um, for example, in Libya, there is conflict between warring parties and uh, a smaller conflicts in the form of uh, um, terrorist groups like in uh, Egypt and Tunisia. But so the point I wanted to uh, further clarify is the need and the necessity to provide an explanation of the political and the military situation in the country in order to better understand the implication of the pandemic on that. And uh, regarding these variables or aspects, it's clear whether in Libya or in other North African countries, there is institutional vulnerability and failure and it, this has a dire repercussion and uh, implication on the ability to respond and to be resilient. Uh, and as Mr. Ahmed from Libya said, uh, there are different aspects pertaining to governmental corruption and it's playing an, a key role in, uh, in destabilization and in compromising trust between citizens and uh, the government. And uh, I remember that in on Facebook, I saw that uh, someone from Lebanon uh, was uh, saying that we need to be treated as peoples and not as states, uh, that assistance needs to go to citizens and to peoples and not to states. Um, providing assistance to states uh, has become obsolete uh, as an idea, and uh, we have to rethink of a new balance, uh, a new formula uh, that can uh, be uh, better welcomed by the communities, uh, while also keeping the same or keeping the relationship with the government because it is a necessity. And uh, that's a key question uh, that is uh, uh, per persistent in my opinion. How can we reach the government or how do we keep interacting with the governments while reaching the peoples in a better way? And uh, the second issue um, pertains to um, the militia groups, uh, the armed groups which has claimed authority and power. So how can we handle these groups, which are um, unofficial authorities uh, in the status quo, and uh, how can we um, deal with the absence of trust between the government and the grassroots? And uh, here I would like to mention one important issue uh, faced by international organizations, the UN, or, and so on and so forth which is um, um, how can we um, strike a balance between our uh, between the general interest or the public interest or the state interest and on the other side the ethical and uh, the need to provide assistance and help uh, to these afflicted uh, peoples um, and who have a dire humanitarian needs, like what's happening in Lebanon now. And the result of all of that, uh, this idea is open for discussion with the uh, speakers as well as with the audience. Maybe we can't uh, fix it today, but uh, it's uh, food for thought. Uh, regarding peace building programs, and uh, international peace building programs and strategies. It's high time to restructure the idea of peace building uh, and to look for that from, a, from people's perspective, not from state perspective. And many, uh, many strategies, many research pieces um, elucidated that it needs to be bottom up and not uh, top down. Um, arrow or process uh, without uh, taking too much time I, would, I will conclude by saying that change should happen at the level of strategies and also at the language used or the discourse used in peace building and uh, the need to have a, a more appropriate language and discourse to the economic and social um, context 
it shouldn't be a globalized vision or a westernized vision and perspective and uh, um, that's the question how to com how to compromise with all of that and uh, maybe in the q a session we'll have more um, time to discuss all of this thank you shireen I'll ask some of the questions we received in the chat room. Uh, the first question is targeting or is um, with uh, targeting Mike and also Shireen. So, Mike, the first question. On the humanitarian assistance and more specifically on the coordination of humanitarian assistance and whether there, uh, there are any efforts at the international level to improve the coordination of humanitarian assistance uh, while learning from the pandemic. So the floor, uh, the mic is yours, and then uh, we'll see what Shireen has to say about it, because I know it's part of her interest as well. Um, I mean, I think we are seeing um, some real efforts trying to improve the humanitarian efforts, but uh, we've also, I think, have seen how the efforts have been challenged, um, in part by way of the decentralization that has been occurring um, uh, within the international humanitarian community. Um, this is where leadership is really needed to step up to help guide the humanitarian efforts. And the problem is, of course, is that the, the coronavirus comes on top of many crises that have been occurring um, throughout the region already. Um, what has been occurring in Syria, uh, the crisis in Lebanon on top of the uh, the dire situation that happened yesterday with the, um, with the explosions. But we see where, um, you know, people are seeing that there is a strong need for humanitarian assistance. Um, but again, providing that, the, that assistance in the middle of conflicts has been incredibly challenging, uh, particularly, as I said, as we have witnessed that in, in Syria, in particular, in gaining assets into uh, Syria. Um, but for other places, of course, there's a problem where because coronavirus has been a pandemic, it is worldwide, the countries have turned inward to try to deal with the problems themselves. And so um, uh, in the United States, for example, as the U.S. has been trying to grapple with its, uh, the coronavirus, including its economic impact, and the U.S. Congress has been providing um, funding to help shore up the economy to get it through the coronavirus. Um, uh, part of that has been uh, a difficult time for legislators to include money for overseas assistance. Um, uh, but we have seen that, that there have been a number of champions who have been trying to, uh, to provide, um, as I say, money more for the humanitarian assistance. Um, it, it's all occurring at a very taxing time, um, at a time when uh, the systems are being really tried to see how well they can cope with this. Um, so, um, and as peace builders, you know, there's, it, you have this kind of, it was interesting, I guess, when you look at what, particularly what Tariq was talking about here, where um, you have the elements that, that should be going for humanitarian systems to help with the health crisis, but it has a knock-on effect, as you were describing, in terms of helping to build trust back between the government and the people um, at the same time. So there's, uh, uh, maybe this is what uh, Shireen is talking about in terms of how we think about our terms of discourse, in terms of that it's not just, you can't just look at things in, in, in particular grooves or silos that over here is humanitarian assistance, over here is peace building assistance, that there seems to be now more of a marrying that needs to take place between them. And and I, I would just finish there, Eli, by just talking about saying that uh, one of the, the big casualties of the pandemic has been this issue of trust. Um, and it has really tried individual countries and so on. And, um, and I think a key part of our agenda will be how to weave back together and make stronger a social compact between the, uh, the governance and the civil society. Thank you, Mike. Shireen, would you like to add anything on humanitarian assistance? 
In my opinion, uh, the coronavirus uh, pandemic uh, is a real test to the international community and to the region, to our region. And uh, in this test, I don't think that any of the international institutions or parties can say that they uh, are victorious or successful. And uh, it's a, an opportunity for learning, actually. Uh, we have seen many mistakes, and these mistakes cost lives, actually. And um, I think two details are very paramount. Uh, the first one is coordination between relief uh, organizations and uh, uh, the countries like Yemen, where we focus our research. Uh, the coordination is very weak. Uh, between the relief and assistance organizations. They don't work together, unfortunately. And uh, the absence of coordination between these organizations is one problem. But the bigger problem is that uh, they don't have any relationship with the grassroots organizations. And uh, they are not using the same language. They are not coordinating. And uh, they are unaware of the power dynamics locally. And uh, as a result to that, as a result to the lack of coordination, uh, um, I can say that uh, these mistakes are now opportunity for learning for the future, not just for uh, the relief organization, but also development organization, which have a larger scope uh, in order to provide a response to humanitarian crises. Thank you, Shireen. There are uh, many questions about Libya, and I would like to give Ahmed an opportunity to respond to these tough questions. But before that, and there are two aspects that I deem very important. One, the implication of the corona pandemic on the space occupied by civil society in some countries. And the second question is about uh, the implication, or the impact of the coronavirus on women. So uh, the, uh, to what extent women were affected by the pandemic? We will cover these two questions and then we will move to Libya because we have um, a plurality of questions about Libya. So let's start with the civil uh, society space in the region, Shiri. Uh, in your opinion, how um, how can we perceive the impact of the pandemic on civil society? Regarding civil society, and I don't see this as a, uh, inextricably linked to the coronavirus, but uh, the tightening the, the tightening measures on society uh, has been there even before the pandemic. And the pandemic now uh, has become yet another reason for the tightening of measures uh, for the tighter spaces provided for the uh, society organizations. Yet at the same time, in some other countries like Yemen, civil uh, society is playing a paramount role in in responding uh, uh, to coronavirus and uh, uh, in building uh, social cohesion and community response. Yet, despite all of this mom society momentum, there are certain uh, problems like um, access to finance, or access to funding, whether from the international community or from local organizations. Um, there is lack of financing and uh, uh, inability to respond and to interact with uh, other organizations working in the, in the region. And I think the problem lies in the international organizations which have to get closer uh, and provide uh, more and to get closer to the uh, civil society, to local civil society. Let's go back to the question. We have to um, assess civil society um, depending on the state 
uh, some countries, civil society cannot uh, cope, and in some other countries, um, the tightening is not uh, as uh, noticeable. Um, but there are other challenges when it comes to financing and uh, to resources, and it's an opportunity to the international community to intervene and to provide more support and gain more legitimacy. Ahmed Abdel Wahed from Egypt, can you um, respond or reply to the question regarding the impact of the pandemic on women? Ahmed, you wanted also to add um, or to jump on the previous points, so go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Ali, and I thank uh, speakers and I sp thank Shireen. Uh, Shireen talked about uh, su international support mechanism locally and uh, I think from the experience we are seeing uh, on the ground, on the field, uh, there is a growing demand that we are treated as peoples and not as states. Uh, I think, uh, theoretically, this is very ideal, but implementing that on the ground is very unlikely to, to, to reach all um, targeted uh, categories. So uh, the international uh, community uh, is providing funding, um, officially through the government or through the NGOs. But uh, I think there are two issues here. How do we use or to, uh, how do we capitalize on uh, the funding provided? I'm not talking about Egypt exclusively, but I'm talking about the whole MENA region now. And uh, I think that we are not planning collaboratively and collectively, um, and that's a big issue. Um, we are not seeing planning between civil society sector and uh, governmental authorities, and uh, even uh, if there are certain attempts, uh, um, they are very limited, and uh, our colleague from Libya talked about a very important point, to what extent civil society can provide support because there are always suspicion and uh, mistrust to where this funding is coming. And uh, uh, it all boils down to trust building, I think. Uh, civil society organizations um, couldn't uh, build trust uh, at, or with the, with the grassroots communities, and they're not did not uh, gain the trust of the communities of their targeted categories or targeted beneficiaries. At the same time, they did not, or civil society organizations did not uh, play the filling the gap rule between what the people, what the citizens need, and what the country, what the state will be implementing and will be developing. So, civil society sector is being perceived as sector that needs to focus on relief work, on charity, and so on and so forth. And uh, throughout the last five years, uh, we are seeing this in the MENA region, and many international organizations are trying to support civil society to lead or to, to, to get engaged into policies, uh, policy development, and participatory planning, and uh, uh, and that's happening in countries where decentralization is being implemented. And uh, the second point pertains to the current implications. Uh, Shireen, you talked about Lebanon, and uh, one of the projects I'm leading now um, is a research on civil society organizations in Lebanon and how they are, uh, or Yemen, sorry, and not Lebanon, and how they are interacting with the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, Yemen is, uh, has been through a war from a long time ago, so the humanitarian assistance sector is very strong. Uh, some of the, uh, bu uh, the budget of some organizations is more than $28 million. So uh, 
uh, UN also is holding cluster meetings on weekly and monthly basis with them. But there are yet two main issues. First, corruption that is rife, and our colleagues uh, from Tunisia and Egypt uh, and Tunis, Tunisia and Libya talked about it. And uh, corruption is inextricably linked to what extent. Uh, what extent how reg uh, can regulations and laws organize civil society work and community activities and how are they going to be followed up and regulated by the government that's a key point and if one of the think tank wants to focus more and look in depth into the participatory method of uh, developing laws and uh, you still haven't answered the question. We are talking about women now, <laughs> please. Uh, let me uh, give you or tell you a strange anecdote uh, I've heard lately. Many are saying that the coronavirus have uh, led to a, a very central change at the level of the family. The father now is discovering his family, his children, again, because of uh, the obligation to stay at home. And uh, that's an opportunity for fathers, for men, to stay more in their homes and with their children. But it also, there is another facet, actually. There is another negative facet, because we have seen a growing rate of violence household violence. We also um, uh, perceived a growing uh, rate of complaints from women uh, about, uh, about the family, uh, conjugal violence or household violence uh, incurred by their husband. Let me tell you also about the support provided by the international community. Women uh, have lost a uh, lot of the social space they enjoyed, and that uh, had a negative implication on the services provided directly to women previously through the meetings uh, held in the social centers. The mechanisms of uh, these activities have changed. Now we are using virtual platforms like uh, Zoom, but we are talking about countries or places where technology is not available or readily available. And, uh, and these women maybe cannot use the technology as we expect uh, others to do. And uh, uh, this uh, can be tricky with the most vulnerable and most marginalized communities also. Thank you. Shireen, would you like to add something? <clears throat> I would like to say that uh, violence against women has grown uh, due to the, uh, the outbreak of the pandemic and people st having to stay at home more. But that's not the only negative repercussion on women. Most of those working in hospitals are women. They are more liable and more uh, prone to the pandemic itself. And uh, if one of the family members uh, is uh, ill, um, the woman has to stay home to take care of the of the son or the daughter or the husband. So studies conducted recently on the impact of the corona pandemic on the Arab world have uh, shown that uh, the impact on women has been negative. And uh, in some other examples, I can say it is positive, but the role of women uh, has been more paramount and more visible uh, in their communities, and uh, uh, let me go back to Yemen. There are regions uh, which uh, has been more reserved 
with the uh, with the, when it comes to women uh, engagement and women's role in society but now this has changed and women are playing a more important role uh, and uh, are given more space outside in the public sphere so uh, this can be considered a positive uh, impact and uh, we can see here and there some positive light out of the tunnel and uh, um, ultimately uh, the research conducted uh, and not we shouldn't focus exclusively on figures or numbers because many women who are subject to violence do not complain do not uh, uh, do not speak up uh, and uh, they stay at home and they uh, bear their destiny however we need to have more studies focused on the status of women and the impact on women from a women perspective and from the experience of women themselves in the Arab world, not just through statistics and figures. But of course, this does not mean that statistics are, no, are of no importance. Uh, some statistics, uh, of course, uh, speak up uh, themselves. Uh, and uh, uh, in Tunisia, uh, we have uh, 4,000 cases of women that have been registered in which uh, within a period of within a period of two months actually the two months of uh, quarantine actually of uh, confinement let's say this is a, a very important topic for me and uh, i concur with ahmed and shireen because in uh, other countries uh, it's not only uh, violence against women but also discrimination when it comes to uh, quarantine and some women, some quarantined women in some places uh, were not provided uh, treatment. Uh, we have seen this in certain places in Iraq, uh, actually. Uh, some tribes refused to have their women quarantined in quarantine centers, and they, they demanded that they um, they stay at home, and that's very dangerous. Also, access to treatment and to health uh, services uh, has been a topic of discrimination. So women have been um, impacted negatively from more than one aspect. Uh, we are running out of time, and uh, let's now shift to Libya, because we have many questions about Libya. We have two questions, and then we'll see if we have time for more questions. The, two, the first question, despite all the efforts exerted in Libya on peace building and uh, uh, de-escalation, we are seeing that the crisis is growing and uh, exacerbating. So one of the questions we have, uh, what's the impact of uh, uh, these efforts if we are seeing that the crisis is growing and the conflict is exacerbating, you are a peace builder on the field. How do you see the balance between, or the incongruity between the effort exerted and the absence of a result? Um, there are two types of conflicts. There are the Libyan, Libyan, there is a Libyan-Libyan conflict and the international conflict. The internal conflict uh, can be considered a stratification of, um, of um, previous regimes uh, of discrimination against certain tribes and regions. So in general, um, there are, we, can we can consider that uh, it stems from local and internal reason, re reasons, like uh, the ownership of land um, Gaddafi's regime uh, took the took and duly took the land of all uh, citizens, uh, and uh, of, after the revolution, people started reclaiming their lands and their homes. So that was one of the trigger, or one of the biggest trigger of the conflict. In in addition to tribal land. <coughs> For 
example, uh, this land is uh, famously known to be the ownership of uh, that tribe. But then another tribe comes and uh, claims the ownership uh, from before Gaddafi's regime. So it's actually a dilemma. We are supposed to go to the state to redeem for these problems, but we don't have a state. Uh, most of the internal conflicts are related to legal framework, uh, the governmental policies, or because of corruption and uh, unjust or unfair distribution of wealth. That's why we need to build strong municipalities because uh, each uh, region, each municipality has different needs and um, that's why decentralization is key to resolving the conflict and uh, developing um, a peaceful atmosphere and, uh, of course, de-escalation of the armed conflict. And uh, Uh, most of the Libyans are fed up, are jaded with the armed conflict. And uh, um, sometimes you see strange news because, uh, uh, for example, the GNA uh, reclaims control of five uh, um, towns uh, um, in one day. That's uh, proof that uh, the Libyan citizen is uh, fed up with um, fighting and with the armed conflict. They just uh, aspire for peace and prosperity and services and electricity. That's the top priority for citizens. But corruption is impeding all of this. Um, Libya is an uh, oil-rich um, uh, state, but still we have uh, problems uh, that we don't see in very poor countries. Uh, we see that the minister is talking about combating corruption, but uh, that's something new. Um, they are talking about a war against corruption, and that's a, a good signal, actually. Thank you. Uh, uh, regarding the international um, or the global uh, conflict, uh, we, we are seeing that uh, there is um, an agreement between Turkey and Russia on the conflict in Libya. That's uh, actually ab absurd and laughable. And uh, it's like, uh, it's as if uh, we Libyans, we don't have anything to do with this. Unfortunately, the Libyan conflict has turned into a, a third war, an almost third war. There are two questions, please uh, let's uh, try to answer them uh, before we run out of time. And uh, we know that in Libya there is polarization between uh, opponents of the GNA or the, the GNA team uh, party and uh, the opponents of uh, Haftar and uh, his circles. So is there a space for a third party or a third uh, uh, choice in Libya? If you are not with the GNA or with Haftar, can you live in Libya? Can you think? Can you have a role to play? Uh, he, uh, this party should not write about the two other parties. Uh, or maybe you should stay out of Libya. And Tripoli, we have more freedoms than in the other region, and we can criticize the GNA, we can protest. There are uh, some violations of press freedom, for example, but we resist that and we uh, resolved it. Uh, these habits uh, die hard, actually, because uh, um, it's been there for more than 40 years, and now we are trying to change everything in uh, just uh, nine years. So um, things will be tough, actually. Uh, we consider that uh, we have more freedom and liberties in the uh, Western region, in Tripoli, that is. But the solution uh, perceived by Libyans now is election, uh, constitutional referendum and elections 
and of getting rid of all the political actors we have now. And that's uh, the, the main solution perceived by everyone. We are having technical problems from the source. Now we are listening to you, but we, uh, in order to have fair elections, uh, we have to provide the propitious environment, the conducive atmosphere for that. Um, we can't have the Eastern region under the control of one party and the Western region under the control of the opponent and then aspire to have uh, fair elections. And maybe with fair elections, we can aspire to um, recover and to overcome this crisis. Mike, there is an of the sanctions on the response to the pandemic. How the international sanctions on some countries have affected the ability uh, of the international community to deliver on the response to the pandemic? Yeah, um, you know, the pandemic has been interesting to watch as a phenomena in itself. And I think that almost everywhere, people have been taking it incrementally, hoping that uh, that the whole thing will go away in the next month. And now people are beginning to grapple that this is a long-term issue, and particularly until we have a, a vaccine that is readily available. So I think that people, uh, so, um, so it's been easy in this situation for people to say, let's just keep the sanctions on where we are, for, which are done for political reasons. Um, but they're not necessarily taking into account yet how those sanctions interfere with the ability for humanitarian agencies to get into countries to help them deal with the coronavirus. So, uh, so you know, I, I, again, I think that there's been just a tremendous lack of, uh, lag with the international community when it comes to thinking about sanctions and how they have had impact on humanitarian elements and how to place the humanitarian elements as a top priority to say that we have to deal with that. We have to deal with the health crisis. We have to deal with the food crisis. We have to deal with the economic crisis of these places. If we are going to get our arms around and deal with the, the pandemic itself. So there has not been a lot of action to bring sanctions off. Um, if I might just take also a moment here for, to add one more thing, when uh, there's been a number of issues that have been raised like on gender and so on. I would highlight for people if they haven't seen to seen it, it would be to go to the UN Secretary General's speech that he gave as the Mandela lecture on July 18th. And when he talked about um, basically that not only is there a health pandemic, but there's an inequality pandemic, that the, that the, pen, the health pandemic has exposed even more all the inequalities and one of those key inequalities is that of gender. But there's many other inequalities that are being exposed by this. And so he kind of laughed, he pulled all that together in his speech and it's really worth reading if you haven't all seen it. So I highly recommend that. Thank you, Mike. Uh, the last question, not because we don't have uh, questions anymore, but we still have only four minutes. Uh, Dr. Tarak, uh, uh, in Tunisia, before the pandemic, we have seen that we were seeing the international community uh, setting uh, strategy and a plan for Tunisia for the economic recovery and resuscitation. Uh, there were certain uh, pillars uh, the international community was focusing upon in order to support Tunisia economically. After the pandemic, do you think that uh, the same pillars will remain or is there going to be a change or new priorities, for example, uh, by the international community and the Tunisian government? I was, uh, start by talking about uh, an example. Uh, in, we worked in Tunisia on decentralization and uh, municipalities and their role uh, on local governance. But the surprise with the with the pandemic is that uh, 
the work has been central predominantly and uh, uh, in the ministry uh, that is and uh, municipalities were were not the ones setting the plans they had to refer to the minister in order to uh, consult with them and then to get the orders and I think that this is a blow, even though a um, small blow, but it is considered a blow uh, to decentralization and to local governance in Tunisia. And uh, the crisis has shown that there are many deficiencies and uh, shortcomings in understanding uh, decentralization and the implementation of decentralization in dire crises like the one we are going through now because we need to have financial and logistic uh, resources and that's uh, something non-existent in Tunisia because municipalities are waiting for support and for everything actually from the center and from the ministries so I think there is more work to do locally to reinforce and develop the capacities of municipalities regionally and locally to be able to handle such situation. That's the top priority. And another priority is uh, trust building between all parties. Uh, we have to work more, not just uh, in towns and cities. We have to go to neighborhoods, to uh, villages, and uh, to target everyone. And I link or I concur with uh, Shireen a new perspective of peace building and uh, uh, a new lens, uh, bottom-up lens. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shireen. Before uh, ending this uh, um, event, do you want to say something? I think I have only one minute and I would like to use it to thank all speakers and uh, the audience. It has been a great opportunity to rethink uh, many of the methods and mechanisms we are using f in uh, peace building in different regions and countries. And I hope this is an opportunity and a first opportunity of many opportunities for of collaboration between USIP and ODI. And uh, I hope we'll get to have other opportunities of fruitful discussion. Thank you. Uh, before concluding, I will use the last minute to tell you that many questions uh, haven't been uh, replied to, unfortunately, but they will be used uh, in our publication and in the future research we will be conducting. So uh, don't be, uh, or don't worry. Your uh, input will be taken into account, and uh, all speakers um, expressed condolences. Uh, and the sympathy with Lebanon. And I thank you, personally speaking. And uh, m beyond that, uh, when we go through such crises in the region, we sense that there is a high level of sympathy and solidarity. Despite the lack of resources in many countries, we have seen um, a spontaneous movement to support Lebanon, even from Tunisia, which is going through a crisis itself the Tunisian government is sending assistance and support uh, to Lebanon. And that's a very uh, good as a beacon of hope in the region. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank, finally, ODI, Shireen, Robert, and uh, the USIP team, so here, Fatma, and other colleagues for this um, organization. And as I said, we will have a publication uh, issued um, in the aftermath. And the future uh, event will be focusing on the MENA region. And I hope we'll have such uh, prestigious speakers. And thank you. I would like to thank Mike. Thank you for your time. I would like to thank our uh, interpreter, Sharif, uh, for the interpretation. And uh, I would like to thank all speakers for their valuable input and hope to see you very soon. Thank you.